What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, Shrinks and Sneakers. I'm a board certified psychiatrist making mental health content here on YouTube. And if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. It really helps me to know that this material is valuable for you. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much as always for your support. So in today's video, I'm going to discuss what might be one of the more interesting topics in all of psychiatry. And this is the best antipsychotic medication in the world. And if you want to learn what that medication is and how it works, then stay tuned. I've said it before to you guys in previous videos that older medications are more effective and newer medications have fewer side effects. And that could not be tr more true here in the best antipsychotic medication in the world video. The advent of things like the SSRIs in the 1980s and early 90s was largely driven by safety and not necessarily by efficacy. So they're not more effective, they're just safer medications. And if you overdose on them, you're less likely to die as a result of the overdose. Now, the same is true for these antipsychotic medications. These are older medications that are incredibly effective. And this may be the reason most people haven't heard about clozapine, brand name Clozaril, but I'm gonna tell you all about it here. The research is in and it is evident and well established that clozapine is the single most effective antipsychotic medication available in the United States and probably in the entire world. I don't really think any other countries have better medications and it works even in treatment resistant schizophrenia, which can be obviously very difficult to treat, hence the term treatment resistant. And this is a place where no other medication is proven to be effective. And the results speak for themselves. 30% of previously treatment-resistant schizophrenic patients experience a symptom reduction within the first six weeks of starting clozapine. And that number jumps even higher if that person stays on it for six months, up to 60% of treatment-resistant cases experience a benefit in terms of symptom reduction. Clozapine also has a slew of additional benefits, including mood stabilizing properties, so it could theoretically be used in bipolar disorder, a reduction in psychogenic polydipsia, a video I recently made, so check that one out if you haven't, and hyponatremia, of course, associated with psychogenic polydipsia, a reduction in hostility, agitation, and aggression, which can happen in schizophrenia, a reduction in the risk of suicidal ideation, so less suicidal thoughts when you take clozaril or clozapine here. Improvements in substance use disorder, so patients with schizophrenia often use alcohol or other substances. This can help them to reduce the substance use risk. And it may even help schizophrenic patients stop smoking, which as you know, if you are a provider like myself, then treat treating tobacco use disorder is nearly impossible in this population. A logical next question might be, why are most schizophrenics not on this medication? If it's so great, it's an amazing medication, why is nobody taking it? And that comes down to side effects, side effects, side effects, right? Not everyone can tolerate the side effects associated with this medication. And I wanna take you guys through the most important side effects and the ones that often cause problems for my patients. Sedation, so feeling tired. This can largely be mitigated by dosing the medication at night before bed. And this is a common practice that I use in most of my medication dosing because I think it's easy and convenient to remember to take the medication before bed. And many of the meds that have sedating properties can again be mitigated by taking when you're going to sleep. And sedation is a good thing, theoretically, while you're when you're going to sleep. Tachycardia, so that's a high heart rate or increased heart rate. It's worth getting an EKG on patients with pre-existing heart conditions or those at high risk due to hypertension or hypoepidemia if you're going to start clozapine on these patients. Salaria, salaria or excessive salivation. Now this is one nobody likes, so I can't I can't even really spin this at all. But this can lead to drooling, and obviously it's more it's not really um, super problematic, but it's embarrassing. It doesn't look good in public. People become self-conscious about it. And obviously it's something we don't want our patients to have. Dizziness, that's self-explanatory. Constipation, constipation due to the anticholinergic side effects. This should be addressed immediately. If a patient complains about constipation while taking Clozaril, you're gonna want to give them a bowel regimen immediately. Usually something consisting of Senna and Colace will do the trick in most cases. 
Another common side effect or risky side effect is orthostatic hypotension, and that's due to alpha-1 blockade, and this can cause people to feel like they're going to pass out or to have a fall when they stand up too quickly after getting up from a seated position. Another big one is weight gain. This, this medication does carry the risk for weight gain, and that is always an issue for everyone. The serious and potentially fatal side effects. So these are the ones that really make using clozapine difficult. The biggest one, by far and away, is agranulocytosis. You might be saying, what is agranulocytosis? Well, what this is, is a decrease in absolute neutrophil count, and that's a blood test. It's called a CBC for short, and this is a blood test most people get when they see their primary care doctor on a yearly basis. And what you'll find is that the neutrophil count can be decreased if you're using Clozeril. Now, this can put people at risk for serious infections, and this is the reason why everyone on this medication gets weekly blood draws for the first six months. So when you're taking this medication, you actually have to get your absolute neutrophil count checked weekly for the first six months. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Seizures, clozapine actually lowers the seizure threshold, so you have to be mindful in people with a pre-existing seizure disorder or those who might be predisposed to it because of, say, electrolyte abnormalities. And the third serious complication is called myocarditis, and myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart. It's usually due to viral infections, but in this case, it's due to the medication. This is not super common, but it is a very serious side effect, and it has to be mentioned. So now that we know that the medication is extremely effective, but it also comes with a high side effect burden, the natural next question you might be thinking about is, how does this medication work and what makes it different than other antipsychotics? So clozapine actually is unique in that it has very low affinity for D2 receptors. Now most antipsychotics are going to bind highly and tightly and substantially to D2 receptors. In this case, clozapine actually has a greater affinity for D1 and D4 binding. So it's going to block D1 and D4 receptors, not necessarily D2 at the affinity that other antipsychotics do. So this is unique. This is targeting two different dopamine receptors, not commonly targeted by other medications. Clozapine also has significant activity at other neurotransmitter sites, the important ones to think about, and these are the ones that cause side effects, but also potentially efficacy of the medication. The reason why Clozaril is so uh, effective is not totally understood. So it blocks alpha receptors, and this could be part of the reason why people have orthostatic hypotension and sometimes potentially sedation. It blocks histamine H1 receptors, which can result in sedation and weight gain. It also blocks 5-HT2A serotonin receptors, and it's highly anticholinergic, so it's going to block cholinergic receptors, resulting in the constipation, blurry vision, urinary retention common with anticholinergic treatments. It does have two unique properties that I want to point out. And the first one is it actually does modulate the glutamate system. And it modulates the glutamate system by altering the affinity, or sensitivity rather, the sensitivity of NMDA receptors. Now, NMDA receptors are involved in a lot of different things, but it's been a target recently for depression treatment, but also here for schizophrenia because we think ultimately at a higher level glutamate is more likely responsible for the pathophysiology of schizophrenia. And it also increases something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF for short, and this is something that is usually increased with medications and treatments for depression. Clozapine is primarily metabolized by cytochrome P450 1A2 and 3A4, and of course cigarette smoking will cause a reduction in clozapine levels, due to the induction of cytochrome P451A2. Now, this is not the, the nicotine in tobacco products. It's actually the polycyclic hydrocarbons that come from lighting the tobacco and the smoke itself. So nicotine alone, like a nicotine patch or somebody that vapes, for example, vapes nicotine, they're not going to induce 1A2 the way somebody smoking traditional combustible cigarettes would. So before somebody starts clozapine, we need to do a lot of work. We need to calculate the absolute neutrophil count, and it has to be above 1,500. If it's not above 1,500, then we might want to reconsider our options there. Unless the person has what's called benign ethnic neutropenia, and this is, this is a condition seen in African Americans and Asian populations where the absolute neutrophil count could be around 1,000, so lower than the 1,500, 
but it remains stable at that 1,000 cells limit. If neutropenia does develop, treatment will depend on the severity of the drop, right? So if somebody's absolute neutrophil count starts to go down, we can divide this up into mild, moderate, and severe cases. So in mild neutropenia, we define that as an absolute neutrophil count of 1,000 to 1,499. Now you would continue treatment in these patients. You actually would not stop the treatment. You would continue the treatment and you would do blood draws to calculate the absolute neutrophil count three times weekly until it reaches 1,500 at which point you could resume the previous schedule. So if somebody was say on the medication for a year and they ended up having a lower neutrophil count, say uh, 1200, you would check it three times a week until it reaches 1500 and then you would just resume the monthly blood draws at that point after it goes back up. Now what if there's moderate neutropenia? So we're gonna define this as an absolute neutrophil count of 500 to 999, so much lower than mild, obviously. You're going to stop treatment at that point. You wanna interrupt treatment. You don't wanna keep the person on the medication because you wanna see that absolute neutrophil count go back up. In this case, you're going to do blood draws daily. You're gonna be taking an absolute neutrophil count daily until it reaches at least 1,000 and then three times weekly until it reaches 1500. At that point, you're going to do it weekly for the next four weeks before returning to the prior monitoring schedule and restarting the patient on the medication. So essentially you wanna check it, you wanna restart the medication, and then go back to the prior monitoring schedule once the person has reached an adequate level. In severe neutropenia, you absolutely want to stop the medication, and that is defined as an absolute neutrophil count less than 500. So you want to stop the medication for sure, and you want to do those absolute neutrophil counts daily until it reaches 1,000, then three times weekly until it reaches 1,500. Now, patients should not be rechallenged with Clozeril until they've had a hematology consult and or there's clear benefits outweighing the risk. So I, in most cases, it's not recommended to rechallenge the person, but you can do a hematology consult and you can also determine maybe nothing else has worked and the person's schizophrenia is so severe that they absolutely cannot function without this medication, you might reconsider it at that point. I wanna wrap the video for you guys with talking a little bit about dosing, which is actually quite simple with this medication. So clozapine can be started at 12.5 to 25 milligrams at bedtime. I will usually, if I'm using this medication, start my patients at 25 milligrams at bedtime, and then I will increase by 25 milligrams daily in the inpatient setting until a therapeutic effect is, is had and or the person is not tolerating the medication well, for example. If there's side effects or severe problems from the medication, we obviously will stop titrating it. So you can go as fast as 25 milligrams a day, in the inpatient setting and usually in the outpatient setting, you're going to do about 25 milligrams per week until they reach a therapeutic level. You might be saying, well, what is a therapeutic level? So clozapine should be dosed based on serum levels. So this is one of the antipsychotics that you can actually follow blood levels or plasma levels with. And the target blood levels initial with initial treatment is between 200 and 300 nanograms per mil. So you actually do the blood test, you see if the person's in the therapeutic range. If there's still symptoms and the person's not in the therapeutic range, you could continue to increase up to 450 nanograms per mil, but there's no benefit beyond 900 nanograms per mil, so there's really no point in going above that serum threshold. So if the person's still treatment resistant at that point and you're at 900, obviously you have to reconsider your options. If a person's on another antipsychotic medication and you're starting clozapine, you can actually start clozapine while also keeping them on the previous medication. What you're going to want to do is start tapering the old medication and obviously titrating up the clozapine dose. And once the clozapine dose reaches 100 milligrams, you can taper off of the previous medication and just continue to titrate the clozapine to an effective serum level. All right guys, so that concludes my video on clozapine, the greatest antipsychotic in the world. If you guys have questions or comments about the video, please drop them below. I'll be happy to try to get to them. And if you haven't already done so, consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps me to know that this material is valuable for you.